Spirit of the living God, we come before you, Jesus, thanking you for just, just you are amazing, Lord God, and uh, you just do so much. It's just amazing to sit back and watch. And Lord, as always, when we get into your word, we do ask for conviction, challenge, change, to be built up, edified, comforted, strengthened, and ready to go into battle throughout the week. Lord, we praise you. We glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 28, verses 28, 58 through 29, 1. Uh, this is entitled, Be of Good Cheer. Okay, so you guys remember from last week, uh, we were going through a slew of curses. There was some blessings in there, but the curses are just so many and so deep, it's just kind of overwhelming, right? And because of that, I, I really cut it short last week because it just felt like it was just too overwhelming. And I do want you to come back to church and not go and, you know, do something to yourself after you leave the church. So we're going to continue and pick back up with the remainder of the curses. And like I said, this is entitled Be of Good Cheer. Okay, so this is literally Israel's history for their disobedience uh, from the time they've been kicked out of the land, from the time they've been a nation, from all the way back from the beginning of the Assyrian um, deportation that we looked at when we were going through um, the books of First and Second Kings. But picking up in verse 58, after all of these uh, curses of uh, talking about eating your own kids and sweet, delicate parents that were so nice and polite would hide their own kids that they're eating and women eating their placentas and just plagues and all of this stuff happening for disobedience. Why are you looking at me like that? I didn't write. It's in the Bible. <laughs> Verse 58, the Lord says, if you do not carefully observe all the words of the book of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God. Okay, so the glorious and awesome name of the Lord is Yahweh, your Elohim. Yahweh is the great I am. And what that means is the Lord is your becoming one. He is the one who becomes for you and for me, whoever and whatever we need him to be in our situations and in our seasons of life. Um, he's our strength when we are weak. He's our great physician and healer when we are sick. He's our provider when we are in need. He's our righteousness and our flagship. That is, he's our banner, our good shepherd. He's the one who sees us. He sanctifies us. He set us apart. He is our commander. He's also our judge and our chastiser when need be. But even then, he's our gracious and merciful God, the God of all comfort, who delights to show himself as our restoration and our peace. He's both Yahweh Bara, meaning the Lord, our creator, and Yahweh Yasa, meaning the Lord, our savior. So the Lord is telling Israel, if you choose not to revere me, then you will receive the exact opposite of my blessings that I intended towards you. In addition to famine, plague, being conquered by your enemies, and even resulting to cannibalizing your own children, if you persist in your rebellion still, verse 59, then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues and great and prolonged pro plagues and serious and prolonged sickness. Moreover, he will bring you back. He will bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt, which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. Also, Every sickness and every plague, which is not written in this book of the law, the Lord will bring upon you until you are destroyed. And you will be left few in number, whereas you are the stars of heaven in multitude, because you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God. 
So, okay, God is saying, listen, check this out. Not only will you catch all the diseases that you were afraid of in Egypt and all the plagues that you saw in Egypt when I wiped them out of the way, I'm going to bring on you things you never even seen and heard of before. Then you'll be left in few in number where you were once so great in multitude, it was like the stars of heaven. Today, there are 14 million Jews on the planet instead of being in uh, without number. Verse 63, he says, And it shall be that just as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and multiply, multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing, and you shall be plucked from off the land which you go to possess. What does that mean? <laughs> okay, this does not mean that the Lord will be sitting up in heaven taking great pleasure and delight in punishing his people. He delights in our repentance. He delights in pouring out his forgiveness, his grace, and his mercy. Ezekiel 33, 11 says, As I live, says the Lord your God. And that's Ezekiel 33, 11. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but I have pleasure that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Second Peter 3 9. In Second Peter 3 9, it states, The Lord is long suffering toward us, and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Lamentation 3.32. Lamentations 3.32 says, Though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion, according to the multitude of his mercies, for he does not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men. So when he says, I will rejoice over you to destroy you, it's not his pleasure to do so. It is his pleasure to bless, to heal, and forgive. However, the Lord magnifies his word above all. Therefore, he rejoices in fulfilling his word. See, because of his nature, the Lord must be faithful to his word and remaining true to his word pleases him. In this case, he told Israel, here's the promises you will receive for your blessing. And I will delight in bringing that to pass because that is my word. But likewise, this is what will happen for your disobedience. And I will take delight in fulfilling my word. Not taking delight in your punishment, but in fulfilling my word because my word is above all things. Psalms 138.2 says, I will worship towards your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and for your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. So when we're looking at this, you say the name of Jesus, the name of the Lord, the name. But he says, I magnify my word above my name. And so fulfilling his word is where he takes the light. Numbers 23, 19 says this. God is not a man that he should lie, nor son of man that he should repent. Has he said and he will not do or has he spoken and will not make it good? God is going to be faithful to his word. So his delight comes in. I said this. I'm going to do this because that is my word. In Isaiah 55, 11, the Lord says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me void, but it will accomplish what I please, and it will prosper in the thing for which I sent it. In other words, if I sent it for a blessing, it's going to prosper. If I send it for your destruction, it's going to prosper. 
but it's not going to return to me void. So to bring forth the blessings he has promised for obedience, it pleases him. Likewise, fulfilling his promise to chastise or punish for disobedience, it punishes, uh, it, it delights him as well. It's all about the Lord fulfilling his word. This is why we have the written word. It's the word that sanctifies us, right? Yes, we are led by the spirit, but only as the word confirms it. Because you can be moved by all kinds of spirits, but if it's not the word, then it's not the Holy Spirit. And a lot of people say, oh, the spirit moved me. I believe you. But what spirit moved you? That's the question. The Lord's nature, it includes his justice. It includes his grace. It includes his mercy. People always say they want the justice of the Lord. You don't want the justice of the Lord. The justice of the Lord means you getting what you deserve, what you have worked for. You don't want the justice of the Lord. The justice of the Lord is that which is right in his sight. So this person has got on your nerves. The Lord commanded you to forgive them. You say, well, I don't think I should. Well, the justice of the Lord for you being unwilling to forgive is him turning you over to the tormentors. Do you want the justice of the Lord? I'd rather forgive. But because the Lord is complete in his nature, he's able to to um, exercise every aspect of his divine nature according to his word without conflict and without contradiction. So how can the Lord bring forth both justice, grace, and mercy? In Jeremiah 18, 18, 7, it says this, the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, and to de to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, then I will relent from the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning the kingdom to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good which I said that I would benefit it. Now, therefore, speak to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying this, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now, everyone, from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. So God is saying this, here's my justice. This is what you're going to get. And it's not changing. However, my nature also brings forth grace. If you repent, I'll relent. We see this in the book of Jonah. The Lord's message to the Ninevites was, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, we've studied about the Assyrians, how evil and cruel they were, right? The Assyrians are modern day ISIS. Same people, same place. And it says, when they heard the message, the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast, fast, put on sackcloth. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he thought he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. He remained faithful to his word and took delight in fulfilling it. Now, if you remember in the book of Jonah, Jonah was mad. Because of God's grace. He was mad because God forgave the people. I mean, he preached and the entire city got saved. He wasn't happy about that. He was mad at God because of his grace. That is us. We hate to see people forgiven. We hate to see people blessed. Why should they get off the hook? Well, apply that same standard to yourself. Well, I'm not as bad as them. In whose eyes? Because God is faithful to himself, he will always feel, fulfill his word. And because of that, we always have his hope. And this hope is according to his word. 
in, ex in Exodus 34, 6. This is what the Lord said about himself in Exodus 34, 6. I am the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abund abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. When you're in trouble, run to the scriptures and tell God, this is who you are, right? I was about to spank my daughter and I told her, give me the belt. And she was crying. She gave me the belt and she handed me the belt and she said, but, but, but you love me so much, daddy. <laughs> Go outside and play. <laughs> Hebrews 4.16 says this. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to, to help in a time of need. I'm in trouble, Lord. I'm running to you, not from you. Psalms 86.5 says this. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive, abounding in mercy to all those who call upon you. In Isaiah 54, 10, the Lord says, For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has mercy on you. That's Isaiah 54, 10. And so when we know how bad we are, there's no sin that we commit that trumps the grace of God. So falling, falling, falling on his love, his grace, and his mercy. And yes, Lord, whatever you decide is good, right, and true. But if I can help you out, just kind of put it over here. <laughs> fall upon his grace. Fall upon his mercy. And don't listen to the lies of your own emotions or the enemy or the people he uses. It's hard because, yes, God, you forgive me, but people who I live with is the problem. So I need help. So verse 64, he's continuing in his curses are the result of the curses, what they will look like. Then the Lord will scatter you from among all the peoples from one end of the earth to the other. And there you shall serve other gods, neither, which neither you nor your fathers have known, wood and stone. Okay, so beginning back in 722 BC, that's when the northern kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrian empires. Since then, the Jews have been getting uprooted and scattered across the globe and persecuted horribly and mistreated and abused. Less than 140 years after the northern kingdom fell, um, in 586 BC, Nebuchadnezzar with the Babylonians conquered, destroyed, and carried away the southern kingdom of Judah. And then after returning 70 plus years later, um, Israel found themselves under the rule of the Persians. From the book of Esther, we learned that the Jews were scattered throughout every part of the Persian empire. Um, under King Xerxes, you know, 300. And he reigned over 127 provinces ranging from India to Ethiopia. Jews were scattered throughout the Persian Empire. Then Alexander the Great came and conquered and the Greeks ruled over. And then the Romans conquered the Greeks and the Jews were scattered into Europe. So from the Middle East, from Africa to now Europe, they were scattered throughout the world. In 70 AD, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, the second temple. Later, in 132 AD, the Romans under an emperor named Hadrian destroyed Judea and changed the name of Israel to Palestine after the Philistines, who were Greeks. 
we're going to look back at, we're going to look more at that in a little bit. But Hadrian, what he hoped was by changing the name of the land, the Jews would lose their identity and then Israel would cease to exist. But long before Hadrian and long before the Babylonians uh, and Nebuchadnezzar, the Lord said they will never lose their identity. In Jeremiah 31, 35, Jeremiah 31, 35, it says this. Thus says the Lord, who gives sun by light, by day, and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for light by night. The Lord who disturbs the sea and causes waves to roar. The Lord of hosts is my name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. In other words, God was saying this. If you can stop the sun from shining and the stars from being in outer space and cause the sea to just lay down and be still, then Israel, the Jews, will stop being a nation. But since those things will never stop, guess what? They will forever be a nation. Now, as a people, the Jews are the only people group in history on the planet who have been without their homeland and did not lose their identity. The Jews stayed Jews no matter what nation they were in. They always remained distinctly Jews. And the land of Israel, the land, the geographical location, belongs to the Jewish people forever. And when the Lord scattered them, he promised to bring them back. Think about it. Pharaoh tried to destroy them. The giants, before they conquered the land, tried to destroy them. Haman tried to destroy them. The Romans, the Spaniards, the Russians, and the Nazis, and today's Muslims have all tried to destroy them. But guess what? The Jews are still here. Verse 65. So he says, I'm going to scatter you, and you're going to serve other gods, which you never knew. Verse 65, and among those nations, you shall find no rest, nor shall the sole of your foot have a resting place. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and anguish of soul. Okay, so the Lord is saying this. Since you don't want to worship me or retain me in your hearts, keep me in your mind, or stay in the land that I have given you, I'm going to redraw, withdraw from you the sense of my presence. When I scatter you and send you into other nations, instead of my quietness, instead of my assurance, instead of my security, rest and peace, I'm going to give you a trembling heart. And that means a timid, quivering, shaking, agitated, and always disquiet and fearful heart. Now, to me, what's scary about that is this, and it's awesome. The scriptures tell us in 1 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. But here he says, I'm going to withdraw my presence, and the heart that I'm going to give you is going to be trembling and quaking. You're going to have failing eyes, meaning your eyes are going to waste away because you can see that your doom is looming and near and is close to completion. Think about the mental trip that is happening here. But then Philippians 4, 6 says, be anxious for nothing and everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God in the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He said, because you don't want to retain me in your hearts and minds, I'm going to uproot you from your place of peace in the land, and you're going to have anguish of soul, meaning your mind is going to be tormented and distressed. 1 John 4, 17 and 18. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, 
so are we in this world. Think about it. Is God afraid of anything? Does anything stress God out? Does he sit on his throne biting his nails? Oh, I didn't see that one coming. He says, so as he is, so are we to be in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So think about this is what he's saying. My scripture says I haven't given you a spirit of fear. I give you my peace and perfect love. There's no torment. You have a power, love, and a sound mind. You should be anxious for nothing. But when I withdraw from you the sense of my presence, you'll find no rest. You'll have no peace. But you will have a trembling heart, failing eyes, and anguish of soul. Verse 66. Your life shall hang in doubt before you. You shall fear day and night and have no assurance of life. In the morning you shall say, oh, that it were evening. And at evening you will say, oh, that it were morning. Because the fear which terrifies your heart and because the sight which your eyes see. Proverbs 21, 8 says, 28, 1. Proverbs 28, 1 says this. The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. I remember being a criminal and the police, they could be down the street and I'd be terrified. They're not even looking for me. But the wicked flee when no one pursues. And then when I got on drugs, that was even worse. It was like, oh my gosh, I am outside of God. They're going to get me. They're going to get me. Who's going to get you? Why are you so nervous? What'd you do? I didn't do anything. What's wrong? Oh, I'm scared. Because the wicked flees when no one pursues. But when you know you haven't done anything wrong, you're bold as a lion. But when the Lord allows you to fill yourself outside of his will, it's like you can literally feel the walls of doom, destruction, and darkness closing in upon you. There's no peace or, or no soundness in your soul. There's an ongoing feeling that any moment your greatest fear will be upon you. You have knots in your stomach. Your appetite is gone. Maybe that's not you guys, but this is me. So, Sleep escapes you, and you're just wishing for morning to come. But when morning comes, you're wishing that it was night so that you can get some sleep, some sort of peace. But then when you do doze off, tormenting fears prevail, keeping your mind alive and active so you're really not asleep. It's just tossing and turning. On top of all of that, not eating only increases the stress and anxiety. The fear is magnified and you're wasting away looking pasty and pale. Psalms 31.9 states this, Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye wastes away with grief. Yes, my soul and my body, for my life is spent with grief. My years with sighing, my strength fails. Because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. I know I've been there and I've seen other people there. And it's like, this week they were looking pretty good. And then they got in trouble. And then I see them a week later, I'm like, man, you know, age 10 years. It's just the Lord saying, let me remove my presence. Just let you feel that I have removed my presence from you. Verse 68, and the Lord will take you back to Egypt in ships by the way of which I said to you, you shall never see again. And there you shall be offered for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but no one will buy you. Okay, so the Lord told Israel, you shall never go that way again. Now, what he, when he said that, he was telling them, you should never turn your hearts back to Egypt for relief, for anything, because 
you should have me. However, in your disobedience, I'm going to send you back to Egypt. So after the Romans destroyed the temple in uh, 70 AD and they killed millions of Jews, they shipped thousands more to Egypt as slaves. But then they started allowing them to return back to the land again. And then the Romans gave them permission to actually build a third temple. But the Jews started messing up again and caused another uprising. Then in 132 AD, Hadrian came and just leveled Jerusalem. Um, he turned it into a pagan city. He renamed it, he renamed Jerusalem to Athelia Capitolinia. And then he changed the entire land of Judea, the, the entire land of Israel to Palestine. Because he wanted to totally degrade, disrespect, and erased the Jews from history. Then he sent more Jews to Egypt as slaves, but there were so many of them that nobody wanted to buy them. So they were basically giving away free Jewish slaves just to take them off their hands. Now, today we have this black racist cult in America called, that called themselves Hebrew Israelites. You probably have seen them somewhere standing on corners looking like um, court gestures with capes and satin suits on, hollering in bullhorns. Well, they claim that black people are the real Jews, and this verse proves it because black people were black, bought to America on ships. But these same people adamantly deny that they are of African descent because Africans are descendants of Ham. And since they are the true Jews, they are descendants of Shem. They also say that Egypt in this verse means America. Okay, there's all kinds of problems with that. <laughs> because the scriptures mean what the scriptures mean. Egypt means Egypt. Israel means Israel. Israel does not mean the church. Egypt does not mean America. And you got to think about that. This is 40 years after leaving slavery in Egypt. God is not going to tell Moses, you know, you're going to go to Egypt. That's not Egypt where you just came from. You're going to a mystery Egypt. <laughs> But look, it says the Lord will take you back to Egypt in ships. Now, somehow these Hebrew Israelites with their twisted doctrine must have been in America once before and completely left. And then they came back during the slave trade because since Egypt means America, they must have been in America, right? It says, there you shall be offered for sale as slaves when no one will buy you. Okay, well, the slave trade in America was big business, and it was nothing but buying and selling of slaves, and it was the transatlantic from Africa to America slave trade, which they bought and sold slaves. But this says no one will buy you. So when you ask them all this kind of stuff, they really just get mad at you and yell at you. And tell you, you have been corrupted by the evil white man. Which, the evil white man is Edomites. Okay. Edom is Esau. Esau's twin brother is Jacob. Somehow these identical twins, one came out black and one came out white. From parents that were Chaldeans. Somehow the Chaldeans were also black because Abraham was black on the other side of the Euphrates next to Russia. Anyway, it's a cult. The Hebrew Israelites, they agree with the Muslims that the Jews do not belong in Israel because they're not really the real Jews. They also say that Hitler was right because he was trying to ex exterminate the imposter white people that claimed themselves to be 
Jews. They have no desire to go to Israel, but they want to stay in America and plunder the white man because that is the doctrine of plundering. Somewhere they get plundering doctrine out of the Bible because the Bible says plunder somewhere. Anyway, so if you ever run into these people and they look like uh, Grandmaster Flash in the Furious Five, don't just... Yeah. So yeah, Egypt is no longer Egypt. It is America. Verse verse 1 of chapter 29. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant, covenant he made with them at Horeb. So remember, Deuteronomy is 40 years old after coming out of Egypt, 38 years after Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, they got the covenant. But this is an additional part of the covenant. Um, the, the parts of Deuteronomy include parts of the law that they would begin to do once they possessed the land. Because while they were in the wilderness, there was a lot of things that they couldn't do because they weren't there yet. So they had the covenant and an additional covenant, not two different things, but just in addition to the law. It looks kind of like this. Um, in our lives, there is the first part of our salvation when we get saved. There's those things that the Lord speaks to you that brings you to salvation and you're saved and you're kind of, you're at this new place, right? But then the Lord begins to speak to you those things that pertain to walking out your salvation since you have been born again. And as you continue in your walk, as you continue your sanctification, the Lord is continually speaking new things to you as you walk, right? Because when you first get saved, it's just, Jesus, your God, I'm a sinner, save me. Okay. But then there's things like, you need to work on your attitude. But I'm a good person. No, 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 you're not. You need to believe my word. But I thought this. No, that's wrong. So you start growing in these new things, right? So it hasn't. it's not that God has changed. It's that you are in a new place. And so that's how this these two covenants look with um, Mount Sinai and on the plains of Moab. In John 16.33, as we are walking through life in our salvation and things of the world are constantly coming against us. In John 16.33, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Okay, so it's like, the closer you get to God, the less stressed out you are about things in the world, right? The less you're trying to hold on to things in the world because it really doesn't matter, you know? In Isaiah 57, 15, the Lord says, Thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and revive the heart of the contrite ones. So the Lord says, listen, for a while you were acting up and I slightly took my finger off of you and let you experience what it's like not to have my presence. And you came back with a broken and contrite heart. And now I'm here to revive you, to strengthen you, to heal you and make you new. Because I dwell with those of a broken and contrite heart, the humble. I resist the proud, but give more grace to the humble. 
And in John 14, 27, Jesus said, peace I live with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In other words, the Lord says, I'm with you. I haven't left you. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. No matter what trouble is going on in the world, you are mine and you are secure. So abide in my peace that surpasses all understanding and be of good cheer. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you so much for your word and we praise you that you are sovereign over all things and nothing happens outside of your word and that you are faithful to fulfill your word and that we can look to you according to your word. We can cry out to you according to your word. We can trust in your word in spite of what we feel, in spite of what we see, in spite of what anyone says, you remain faithful and you are true. And so we thank you for your grace, your salvation. We thank you for your correction and your cleansing and your healing. And for anyone listening to this message right now and you want that peace of God that just goes beyond all comprehension and understanding, you know you need, you're in need of salvation and rescuing. Say this prayer with us, with me. Lord Jesus, I believe you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose again three days later. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, to make me your child. And according to your word, I thank you for making me yours. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray, we give thanks, we give you glory. Amen and amen.